back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week is Ruth Singer. Ruth, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, boy. We're going to be here for three hours, I think. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, th- I think that, that the uh, best way to describe you is, is the quote you have I found somewhere in all your writings, that you work mainly with old cloth, often damaged, torn, and worn, which I combine with hand stitch, natural dye, quilting, applique, and mixed media to create subtle and emotive pieces. Yep, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It's one of the things I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of what I do. Um, my textile practice is part of a whole package of kind of portfolio career I think it's called now so I do lots of other things as well which is a lot of teaching working with people teaching writing um sharing my work so the but in order to make this like you know shorter than three hours (laughs) hopefully we'll just talk about the textile practice rather than all of the rest of the million things I do oh yeah for people listening uh roostsinger.com and you um uh, there are books, magazine, podcasts, uh, mm-hmm. projects. Uh, yeah, it's it's an endless thing. Uh, we'll never cover all of it by a long shot. Um, <clears throat> but before, all right, so we're going to talk about your projects because I think that's the most interesting way to to get a sense of what you do and how you go about it. But I have to hear the story about Aunt Aunt Anne Good- Goodstein. Sounds like she was uh, uh, a big part of it. Yeah, I think. I, unlike most textile artists, um, I didn't grow up learning textiles with my mum or my granny, um, because my mum doesn't make. And um, my granny that was a professional seamstress, she died before I was born. So I didn't get to learn from her. So I didn't grow up surrounded by textiles like most people. But my aunt, um, she did so and she did make things and she was really interested in fashion and textiles and history and so she because she was a big influence on me even if though she didn't particularly teach teach me sewing but just hugely influential as a person so um sadly she died very young um and she was 46 when I was a teenager and you know that obviously has a has a big impact on the whole family but it's something I wanted to make um, a memorial piece about how when I was doing a whole project about um, called emotional repair and I wanted to make some pieces that were about personal emotional stories and one of the concepts that I came up with was to make a memorial piece about her or for her and that actually it was a kind of slow process of all of my work is very slow in terms of the making but also the thinking process it can take me a long time to work out what I want to make I've got a concept and then I'd work out what the, what the how I'm going to make it into something. So it took quite a long time for me to work out that what I was going to make was pin cushions. And that was because I'd been doing research on pin cushions and looking at historic pin cushions and how they were used as given as gifts and memorial pieces. Um, forget me not pieces. You get forget me not pinned decoratively into pin cushions and they were given at births of children. And anyway, it, it you know, in the 17th century. So it felt um like an an interesting concept to explore so I made 46 of them to represent the 46 years of her life Mm. and each of those pin cushions is a different material antique textiles hand stitching all sorts of different things so they've all got really complex kind of meaning behind them and that really as part of the way I've developed my work over the last few years is that there is a story and this narrative a meaning behind everything that I do so every choice that I make with materials or stitch um, or decoration or pattern has there is a meaning to it rather than purely decorative that's just the way that I, I work so that's how kind of that that's where that project came from so that's gone straight into a kind of like a sad story to start off with <laughs> but um, I think because I've done a number of projects that are about kind of the tougher side of human experience there's an assumption people seem to assume that that's kind of what I'm like um I'm not actually <laughs> quite a cheerful person really I just find the the less the more hidden stories more interesting um creatively so that's why I go down those kind of routes she is not a depressed no, no. sad person <laughs> right right 
So how do you organize something like that? Because here you've got, you're trying to do something for somebody's life, one year of their life. Um, did you keep like a separate notebook for each year? Did you have like, or a, um, no, nothing is, nothing is, nothing is organized. Nothing that. It is more intuitive, I suppose. Once I'd come up with the concept, I started making, and actually, I say it, it actually took me several years because I started making the series for an exhibition that I had in 2015, didn't get it finished. So I didn't mention that it was supposed to be 46 pincushions. <laughs> and then a couple of years later, I had another show, another opportunity to exhibit that work alongside some other work. So I finished it off. So it actually happened. I produced it over the course of about three or four years in the end. Um, so it's more that kind of each idea led to another one. So I'd explore some with some antique textile and think, oh, actually, it would be really nice to. She collected, for example, she collected blue and white antique porcelain. So I wanted to have blue and white fabrics in there. So it took a while before I found the right blue and white fabrics. So, um, yeah, there's no nothing that they're not representative of an individual year. They're just a, rep a number in okay. total, total number. Yeah. Right. So, so but it did represent to you her life. Yes. Um, yes. What you knew of her. Yeah, obviously. OK. I just wondering, because like if you because like here you are collect probably started collecting blue textiles and I would think, OK, this is not quite the right blue. But what do I need? You know, I don't know, a notebook of some sort where you staple samples of. Yeah, there are. And, there, yeah. I mean, I've got bits and pieces like that there. Are, I, I never used to at that time. Yeah, this is a few years back now. I never used to keep very good records or very good kind of sketchbooks. But now I've developed, I, I actually do that as part of my practice now is what I call them project books. So they're not sketchbooks because there's no drawing generally. And then there's a lot of notes and samples and ideas and bits and pieces floating around. So I, for every project I do, so every sort of concept or idea that I'm exploring has its own sketchbook, project book. Um, so now I would probably have a, a clearer record of my thinking process. Whereas then it's like scraps and pieces of paper and notes here and there rather than <laughs> anything that I could kind of pull out and show to people. But I've, I've learned over the years to create because so much of my work is about sharing. So with exhibitions and teaching and um, running my membership and things, I'm always kind of talking about my creative process, sharing what I do. So having my sketchbooks, my working documents. Um, kind of available is really really beneficial to that because it, it kind of illustrates what I'm talking about when it doesn't necessarily there isn't necessarily a finished piece of work to show for it sometimes it's just exists in the sketchbook yeah I, I'm thinking I've got um I'm going to be working a 17th century casket and yeah. I, I really I, I started it and then I stopped and and I'm thinking you know what I need to do is keep a notebook with it and take yeah. notes on what I'm doing because while I started working, I started, my mind immediately started changing the design. And mm -hmm. I thought, now I can't remember what I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I didn't write it down. And so that's why I'm curious. I'm always asking artists, you know, do you keep a, some sort of sketchbook? Do you keep mm -hmm. some sort of notebook? What do you put in that notebook? Because I am very disorganized. So you'll, I have post-it notes all over the place. And I'm like, my kids will come and they'll say, okay, what's this post-it note, mom? And it seems like it needs it needs to be a little bit more organized. So a, a notebook uh, sort of concept. Yeah. And I just wondered because yeah. you do such a variety of work. So like mm -hmm. if you're doing cyanotype work, I, it, it doesn't always work the first time. Um, ask me how <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm wondering if you could probably keep notes on those sort of things, too. Mm, no. <laughs> No, you so don't. Touching. No, no <laughs> just I'm really experiment, technical, huh? technical notes. I know when I've I've done a quite a lot of printmaking over the years um, in a specialist print studio, and I always think I should make notes on this so I can remember how to do it, and I don't. So no, no, no I'm actually quite disorganised. Um, so I keep <laughs> thematic notes, ideas. is what I keep notes of. I'm not very good at the yeah technical details. Um, quite often, like a course I've taught. And I think, oh, yeah, I can run that course again. Where are my notes? Oh, I, I didn't keep any notes, so I have to reproduce it all again. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, no, not, not as organized. As... <laughs> I, I feel much better now. I feel so much better. Yeah. 
because <laughs> that, that's the, uh, you know, why take notes? You know, I just go in like I'm if I do some sort of printing, I just throw it. Someone says, well, how do you do it? I was like, I paint it on. I throw it outside. <laughs> it makes a print or it doesn't make a print. You yeah. know, yeah, it's an experimental process is always good. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the one thing when when I first started looking at, at your work is you describe yourself as a maker mm -hmm. and, you know, encountered other people who are, are makers in one form or another. But you truly are. I mean, textile art is at the at the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you truly are a maker. Uh, uh, take an idea concept and make something out of it. And it's uh, it's fun to go through and watch how you've developed each of these ideas. Yeah, I do. I think I, I've started using the term artist maker, which I think probably, I don't know if it exists outside of my own, my own head. I don't think anybody else really using <laughs> that because I, the, the making that I do is kind of concept driven, ideas driven rather than functional. Partly, which I guess my early career, I was a more functional maker. I made kind of bag scarves, cushions, um, that kind of textile products. And as I've moved on from making things you can use to artwork, I've kind of shifted how I describe myself. So the artist maker kind of covers both that making you know, the material materials and the technical skills are really important to me, but also so are the ideas and the two have to go together for me um, in terms of what I count as my own work. You know, I make functional things, you know, I make quilts for, for use um, and I make, you know, well, occasionally make clothes, don't do it very often anymore, but I can do that kind of functional sewing and making, but my own creative artist practice tends to all be non-functional kind of work um so artist maker kind of sits a bit better but it, yeah, it makes sense to me whether it makes sense to anyone else yeah, yeah. Things, but so all right the, the projects are what really tell the story so this cultures of care umbrella yeah. umbrella project and, and mm -hmm. there's so many things underneath that so how, how did this come to be yeah it's a i mean it, it came to be in its actual sense, because I have funding for that. So uh, we have in, in the Always UK, helps. <laughs> Art, Arts Council, who you can apply to for funding creative projects with a public engagement aspect to them. So it's not just for artist practice, it's for working uh, and sharing with other people. So and I've done that. I've been working in that way for quite a long time. So I'm familiar with that, that process and what they're what they're after. So which you know which is great for me it means i'm i'm in a position to be able to apply for that funding um fairly regularly so i had a concept that i wanted to explore which was about care and i was able to turn it into a a kind of project that a fundable um project so that's why it's got a whole load of different elements including exhibitions and public engagement and community projects so they're all of the elements that are needed to make it a fundable project luckily for me I also love doing those bits. So I don't feel like that. Then I don't have to add on bits in order to make it fundable because working with other people is really fundamental to how I work creatively. So fortunately for me, it works really well. That the two go together um, rather than having to kind of separate them out. But the Cultures of Care concept came from several years of doing work that was about, like I mentioned, my emotional repair exhibition, you know, talking about memorials and um and loss and grief and all kinds of difficult subjects and approaching them with care so when i was you know sharing personal stories i was it was always about being careful about that um and i did a big project that finished a couple of years ago called criminal quilts which is looking at the stories of women who were in prison in um a local prison in the 19th century and a series of photographs that exist in a in the local archive of those women. And I did ten over ten years worth of work on them. And it had a lot of attention. But something I had to keep repeating was that I am approaching these women and their stories with care. Um, I don't want to sort of sensationalize and I don't want to glamorize 
because they're basically women who are very, very poor and having really, really tough lives and very few choices and ended up in prison um, for just, you know, stealing stuff in order to be able to pay their rent, buy food. You know, so it's I've always approached that as a kind of my work about them was an act of care, you know, kind of in retrospective um, act of care towards them and that I want the work that I do to be to be caring, to be sensitive, to be um, emotional. And what I realised last year that was that a lot of my previous work could come under this 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 kind of umbrella term, this banner of care, without me really realising that that was a term I could use about my work. But somebody else reflected it back to me and said, well, your work's all about care. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it is. <laughs> I hadn't really, you know, all of these disparate or fairly disparate different ideas and projects that I've been working on, they all kind of come together. So um, I decided to create that as a specific project title um, or umbrella that I could then work with a number of different elements of the community engagement exhibitions, my own personal research and doing my own, making my own body of work that were all under that that umbrella. I mean, umbrella, I like the you know, umbrella term works very well, but I think of it as a basket, like with loads of balls of wool or something uh-huh. like that, it, that they all fit, fit together or a sewing, bo- sewing box with all sorts of different bits that fit in. So it's lots, it's got lots of different elements, but they all contribute to different underrepresented or underexplored stories about care. So for my purposes, you know, care can be interpreted in those different ways. For my purposes, it's about caring for nature, uh, caring for the planet, caring for people, and um, caring for. Uh, it's, I'm working with museums, so I talk about caring for objects, but it's a more about museums and community stories, collective histories, and and note like the the underexplored stories of that come up in museum collections. So it's a whole variety of different ways of working and different ideas to explore, but it's giving me the opportunity to to try some things that have been kind of at the back of my mind for ages and I haven't had the space to really dig into them. So that's the background of it. (laughs) Yeah, well, and the Criminal Quilts one Mm -hmm. is, you know, the title Criminal Quilts kind of gives you an initial reaction, but when Mm -hmm. you look into it, at least it struck me as this is not a story of criminals. It's a, a story of survival. I mean, you, yeah, it, it, it really is, is tragic that, that these women have been put in these, in this position to mm-hmm. become criminals to survive, but uh, to, yeah, and to exactly. capture that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it's, it's looking at, looking at the story, the, the wider story from a different angle. So they might've been looked at as criminal statistics, as mugshots, as, you know, lots of people treat them as non-human, you know, not important, of no value um, historically. And the terminology that's used in the Victorian documents about them, you know, it's not, there's no empathy <laughs> in that kind of world. <laughs> so, and I see that as the role of the artist, that, you know, I can come in and kind of reinterpret, look at those stories um, afresh and create something something different from them and, and take a different perspective. And that's the way I try and do or approach all of my my projects is to look at them from an angle that other people might not have done or haven't done as an artist yeah now you have a a, a book about the criminal quilts then yes uh, and that so that tells the stories of Mm -hmm. of a number of these women yeah it's got kind of broader stories so I've the the whole collection of photographs that I worked from there's nine photograph albums of women from the 1870s to to the first world war so I I've kind of told a bit of the story of each of those date periods they're not consecutive there's massive gaps you know there's there's periods where we've got loads of information and some with none um and then also in the archive there is written records that go with them but they don't necessarily match up so there might be written records from one decade but no photographs and photographs and no written records so there's all sorts of gaps um so it was a I had a lot of volunteers working on doing that research with me and we looked into all sorts of different elements they did a lot of research of 
looking at the individuals and tracking some of them through ancestry and looking at their personal stories. And I did kind of broader research about, you know, women in prisons and um, particularly about prison clothing. I did a lot of research on things like that, that kind of the more textile link as well. Um, so the book contains all of that research and then all of my textile work that I made um, for the first exhibition in 2018. So, and, and the previous work that I'd made, because I'd been working on it for a few years by then. So there was a big chunk of mostly quilts at that point. <laughs> I was mostly making quilts. Often confuses people that they're quilts I've made inspired by the stories of criminals, not quilts made by criminals. Which always confuses yeah, people. Yeah. Um, often get that one. People often. Uh, so you know, I, I probably picked a wrong title, but it works. It worked at the time. Um, and since since the book came out, I did carry on working on it for another couple of years, and did some additional work, which mostly isn't even quilts. Um, so <laughs> I kind of allowed myself to go off. This is where I, you know I, I I stray off in different directions. Um, so I've done pieces working with a jeweler and working with a fine artist and painter and all sorts of different elements to that so it's it kind of it could have kept growing could have I could have carried on working on that theme just that theme for the rest of my life but I I always had this other work going on this kind of personal and emotional stories that never really got quite the attention that they deserved because the criminals were taken up all of my um <laughs> all, all of my kind of public capacity so i kind of i've part i kind of put them away now i've i've made the conscious decision to end that project so i'm no longer making work along that theme i'm the exhibition tour has concluded the books are still for sale and i still do talks about it obviously still comes up a lot because it's a really uh, it's got a lot to it <laughs> you know and there's right. there's a lot, a lot there's, there's plenty more to say but I wanted to look at some other stories, which is why the Cultures of Care project came about, because I was ready for kind of re revisiting some of the things I'd started working on on other projects. This kind of the more emotional histories is how I'm describing it now, kind of um, which criminal quilts covered, but in a very specific area only, whereas I can be a bit more broad now um, by creating the Cultures of Care basket of different projects yeah and in in this it's interesting to me it it always amazes me how many museums exist that <laughs> the, you know the small ones that we don't hear about don't learn about and uh in the uk there must must be one on, on every corner because it sure seems like like there's a ton of them but uh you awful lot of work with museums to create all this work yeah, well, that comes from my my background, my training, my first career it was in museums, so it's really fundamental to how I work. I mean, yeah, there used to, there used to be more museums than there are now. When I was a child, I, we had costume museums in both of the cities near me, and neither of them exist anymore. So you know, it um, I have to make the most of what there is what there is left. But because that that my training and my spent my 20s working in museums, that kind of research way of working. So I'd explore around a subject, around an object and finding out all the different angles that might be interesting. I think that is what why I work creatively in the way I work now, that I'm interested in the underrepresented stories, the things people don't always know about a particular subject, because that's how I was trained to look at museum collections and museum objects. Um, so as much as possible, I do try and work directly with museums um, or in archives and historic collections or buildings because I find you know, material stuff really interesting, especially when my work is quite concept driven. You know, with ideas about, you know, my project is about care. And that was a, it's quite hard to make sense of that, what it actually means. Yeah. But when I'm looking at collections care, so I'm looking at how we look after objects in a museum context and what is considered worth caring for or what is considered not important um are quite interesting creatively in terms of the value judgments and things that um that will be cre created around around objects so there's lots of different elements to it but i just think museums are great <laughs> they're just really really <laughs> fascinating they're always i mean i'm not not all museums i have my preferences 
textiles, obviously. Um, and the older, the better. You know, I'm not great with an industrial museum and um, aeroplanes and that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I struggle with that. But I worked for three years earlier in my career in a transport museum. So I worked with London buses and tube trains. Um, so, you know, I think I probably I had, I had my fill of that kind of thing. <laughs> and now I'm like, you know, let me get back to the, the 17th century embroideries, please, because I feel feel more at home with them. Yeah. Um, but it's to do with hand making. That's what I find most interesting. That's what I'm interested in, those older handmade objects, um, particularly textiles, obviously. Um, yeah. And that's what I always get drawn back to. Yeah, the um, uh, the Blossom and Thorn mm -hmm. project. Now, mm. I learned that, that you have the Making Meaning podcast and then the journal. And you've just yeah. you got your first uh, first edition of the Making Meaning journal. Mm -hmm. The Blossom and Thorn project. I yeah. I did not know about hedges. No, apparently you don't don't have them so much in the U.S. No. <laughs> What a no. what an amazing thing! Wow. So they're they the best way to describe them is linear woodlands. So they're sort of rows of trees, but here they can be two, three, four hundred years old, mostly two under two hundred years old, which is still pretty old. Um, but there are some really really old ones, and they're just really interesting. And you know, they were created to keep animals in mostly, but also to keep people out but um they have survived the industrialization of our um of our agricultural system in some places as we've lost thousands of miles of them in the last 50 years but there are still plenty left and i i moved um moved town a couple of years ago and i'm back in my hometown now and i'm living on the very edge of the um housing and then there are fields and with loads of hedges and there are lots of footpaths, so we can walk. I can walk very easily out up into the countryside, um, which is, you know, I forget other people can't, you know, <laughs> lots of places you can't do that, but it, here you can. And a lot of those footpaths run along these old, they're very old route roads that have stayed as footpaths rather than being turned into roads. So they still have their old hedgerows along sometimes one side, usually both. Um, and you know, at various different points of year, they're in the winter, they're completely bare, just kind of showing their tree structure. And then in the summer, they're covered in leaf and blossom and have birds nesting in them. And, you know, you get mice living under them and therefore you get um, birds of prey hunting over them In a, in it, when they're at their best. They can be quite degraded um, and not been looked after for 50 years. So sometimes they are looking a bit thin and sparse, but at their best, they are amazing and they're so they're, they're kept trimmed to kind of below human head height kind of shoulder height probably um so you can kind of see over them until they grow up they go wild so they're kind of you can have quite old trees but they still stay quite small because they're kind of pruned yeah. every year to keep them quite contained but they are interesting culturally and aesthetically and environmentally you know they're really interesting interesting things and I my, my the idea of my project was worked with volunteers um in a specific area um of the national forest which is a new plantation new forestry plantation in um in England where I asked volunteers to go and look at go for a walk on this particular long distance um footpath and report back on what they found and I then made some artworks representing some of the findings, some of the things that they they found or they identified, and particularly looking at um, where they could identify old hedges or um, the number of species, the different tree species in the hedge, um, and all sorts of different elements. And I used some of their photographs, and I used some of my own kind of research walks as well to to create a series of uh, long strips of textile that were each told an element of the story of the of the data and of the the ideas about hedges the thoughts about hedges and then they were originally made to be displayed in an old hedge which is basically some overgrown trees so they, they it's stopped being cut as a hedge and turned into a um 
kind of straggly trees so I actually a festival so I actually displayed them in this in this hedge um a couple of months ago which was a really interesting way of working because I've never done putting my textiles outside and leaving them for three days which is it's quite it feels quite risky because it was a very wet weekend as well a lot of it so there was a massive thunderstorm and um and when I went to collect my work at the end of the weekend it was all soaking wet but it didn't actually come to any harm it was actually fine and um, so it was a really interesting thing when I'm used to exhibiting in a gallery you know you've got walls you've got corners you've got nails to hang things on and, and now I just had a bit of tree and um <laughs> and just had to just hope that nobody damaged it or ran off with it or anything you know it was a kind of quite an interesting way of working because particularly from my museum background of being trained to be looking after the textiles and you don't handle them and you you know you you wrap them in acid-free tissue and you keep them in the in the dark <laughs> right. when you're looking at antique pieces so then go yeah it's fine I'll just hang them in this hedge and leave them <laughs> unattended for three days it was quite a difficult concept but I loved it I loved doing it and I loved the engagement it created so with the volunteers who worked with me they said things like you know I've never looked so closely at this something that I walk past every day you know something that is really familiar for us in this country they're very familiar old hedgerows we, you know but to properly focus on them to properly pay attention and that was what the purpose was for me was to to encourage that kind of close attention and paying attention and close observation and thinking about what they mean in the culturally and personally. So, you know, it's a kind of, it's a taster of what I would like to do more about all sorts of different elements of social and cultural history that we have around us that we don't even notice so much. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah you, you filled in a lot of blanks for me with that project because I follow uh, a number of cyclists who live in northern England and oh. they ride on these footpaths. I mean, there's these paths everywhere mm -hmm. and I'm so jealous because they can just go ride anywhere yeah. and uh, no traffic. And then so they'll, of course, there's there's plannings all along. And, you know, the word hedgerow, hedgerow, that just sounds to me like somebody planted stuff and they keep it trimmed. But then mm -hmm. when you show how they how they actually make hedgerows. Mm -hmm. uh, by bending bending trees and tying them off and then maintaining yeah. that it's just a fascinating thing and then to to embellish that with your art was uh was really fun to see mm, great yeah. i think the, the, the thing with cyclists the reason they don't necessarily like hedges when they is a lot of the the plants that are used in hedges is a hawthorn which has these huge great thorns on it it's really good at puncturing your bike tires yes <laughs> <laughs> so that's the downside of it of when they when there are those they're vicious vicious spikes that on the thorns so yeah can be problematic for cyclists but uh otherwise it's a yeah it's a lovely environment to be in they're really they can be really kind of sometimes they're really high so when if you're walking or cycling on a little road and they're they're way above your head height it's almost like in a little tunnel and they they are wonderful things are they protected there in, in England then? Or, no. um... <laughs> it's, it's not really. Okay. It's kind of, yeah. You, you, you can't rip them out. I mean, for, you know, until the 1980s, you could just rip them out. Um, once they, and, But now you technically can't, but landowners still do, which is, it, it's, it's contentious, yeah, because they're not <laughs> as protected as... Then they're protected in that you can't rip them out, but you don't have to look after them. So... It's a bit kind of like having a historic building. You can't knock it down, but you don't have to look after it. So it's, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's tricky. It's not, it's not an ideal situation, no. And the reason I'm asking is we, um, th there's a place called the Natchez Trace here, and you can see the old trace line. Um, and, it's, and it's sunken because mm -hmm. so many people walked on it. Yeah. And But there's only a few sections left mm -hmm. that are like that. And they... Um, they did finally protect the whole um it's just a narrow strip of land and bicycle there's a road there that you can't go fast on it there and they're they they don't allow trucks on the road and you step off the road to find these sunken bits mm -hmm. and and we ended up and i'm so glad that they got the funds and they protected that because it is a total step back in time when you step onto those 
sunken places yeah. where all these people, it feels like you're stepping back in history. And I would think that the hedgerows would be the same thing. Yeah, yeah. When 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 they're in footpaths, I mean, we have them on alongside the road as well. You know, they can be quite quite mm -hmm. busy roads sometimes. Um, but there is, you know, having these very old paths is really it is absolutely stepping back into history. And I, that's something that I'm I'm working on a project now, doing something similar to the hedges, but looking at footpaths um, and all these walking routes, which you know we're cutting between different farms and different villages across the countryside, and we've got thousands and thousands of miles of them and they're not always that well looked after or protected or open, easy, easy to access you know they're like farm animals on the fields and stuff you know and um, sometimes barbed wire and all sorts of things all sorts of issues happen but you know we are very fortunate to have have those even though there's you know there's limitations um, and issues with them but historically I think it's really interesting with people walking all the time you know it's not that long ago that right. everybody walked everywhere all the time and right. it's yeah again that's the sort of that, this is the sort of thing that i go off on these kind of creative meanders about <laughs> how well, can i make them work to do with walking on old footpaths and um it'll one day it'll it'll filter through the idea and the material will come together and then you know i'll, I'll be able to produce something but for a while there's the idea floating around and it's waiting for its kind of material partner <laughs> to, <laughs> to come to my mind and I work out what they how it, how it comes together that's is why I, my work often takes me a very long time because I don't like to rush into making something just because I've had an idea I have to wait for the the idea and the material to match up and sometimes it comes straight away and sometimes it can take years so it's a slow well, slow process right when I saw your hedgerows um, cloths, I wondered if they were sort of like the um, the prayer cloths, the prayer banners that people have been mm -hmm. um, putting out and actually, you know, um, and leaving out. Um, a lot of people put them like they'll make these little quilts mm -hmm. and then they'll hang them out and leave them outside and let them um disintegrate basically because yeah. we, we all know that those textiles and i was just that was i was that was interesting that you went back and that it bothered you to leave them out like that and it was for a specific event right over, over a weekend so i just had them up for this specific event um i'm i would like i do like the idea of leaving something out permanently i mean i've done it a few times in buildings where i've made pieces of work that are kind of hidden in the building and kind of go back and see what happens um and they mostly all just end up, I mean, I made tiny pieces that like slotted into little gaps and cracks in the wall and like round pipes and things. And eventually they all fell off and I think they probably got hoovered up. You know, because that was in the, the old studio building that I used to have a, a space in and I'd, I'm not there anymore. So I haven't been to check on them, but whether any of it's still there or not, I think they just kind of get sort of swept up in the in the in the in the dust but i don't know but it is, is an interesting idea of like making work and then just kind of leaving it to see what happens and kind of relinquishing ownership of it which is quite difficult when you've spent hours days making something yeah. so right but i think it's an interest in creatively i think it's an interesting way of working of not having this possessiveness but then that comes a problem of like i'm an artist that needs to exhibit you know i go well i haven't got anything to exhibit because i left it out for the uh, the, the, the birds to make a nest in um which is creatively right. interesting but doesn't you don't have a lot to show for it which is why i do a lot of photography and writing about my work because some of it is more kind of ephemeral or short term you know and it maybe needs to it's not going to work in an exhibition you know I have shown Blossom and Thorn, the Hedgerows project, in a couple of exhibitions, but it, it's completely different without without a hedge. <laughs> That's a bit right. Right. Not quite right without its hedge. So, yeah, don't know where that's going to end up, but um, it's always interesting to try different ways of sharing my work and seeing how it works in a different context. If it's made for a specific location, it's completely different in a in another one. So, if it was made to go in a museum, you know, in a, in a historic building and then goes into a white space gallery, it feels very different because it's kind of, the scale is different and the, the yeah. atmosphere of the room and just the physically how it fits, fits in the space is completely different. And I, I just find that sort of stuff really interesting of how things work in different spaces. 
you took me through a little journey with the the blossom and thorn with the hedgerow thing because mm-hmm. then I was reading about your nature nurture idea of mm-hmm. wrapping trees and quilts. Yeah. And when you talked about how you didn't want it to look like it was a setup for a photo shoot, mm-hmm. and you were trying to to convey a concept of caring about nature, and mm-hmm. and then you showed pictures of the quilts, and then I thought, well, well, how did she handle that? with the uh, hedgerows. So I went Mm -hmm. back to look at that art to see if you had, if if it blended in with the hedgerows as opposed to the quilts, which some of them are rather stark whitish wraps around trees. So it was, it was interesting just to see how you handled the two different things. And Mm. I appreciate the quilt thing is, is an ongoing project, but uh, yeah, that was an experiment with some existing quilts to see how they worked on trees. And I did, noticed you know I didn't like the way they stood out if they were really contrasting um like you say the light light color or bright colors I didn't actually like that aesthetically so I'm actually I haven't actually connected <laughs> hadn't connected the two together even though I've written about them in the same um making meaning journal that you're talking about <laughs> but now you're saying that I did probably plan think about the colors for blossom and thorn after I, I did do that after I'd experimented with the quilt. So that probably was in my mind because originally the blossom and thorn was going to be much brighter colours. And I decided actually I ended up making it in the kind of dark browns and greens that completely blended in with the woodland to the point where my work was like quite hard to see from if you weren't right in front of it, you wouldn't necessarily notice it because I didn't want it to look like colourful flags, you know, because it was more more depth to that. It's not just a decorative device. Um, so I made them blend in so much that they kind of disappeared, which was which was interesting again to to contemplate. So when I do come back to the the wrapping trees with quilts, I might try and find something half halfway in between. So right. they're not really stark, but they also don't disappear completely. So people who actually see them, or maybe I should make them so they just look like trees. I don't know. It'd be interesting to try that. Make some that really blend in that aren't obvious at all, and see how that feels. But yeah, yeah. it was it was just an it was interesting mental exercise because yeah, how do you how do you convey caring for nature by wrapping mm-hmm. trees in quilts without look making them look just way out of place? Yeah, uh, and, yeah. and yeah, you could do a camouflage thing and make them disappear visually, but do yeah. you really want to do that? Yeah, that's a tough. Yeah, one. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to get your reflections on it. Thank you. That's really, really useful. So why I like sharing these things, even when they're only ideas. Yeah. Because, you know, feedback, conversations with other people is what makes it exciting for me. I really, I really appreciate any kind of responses. So it's it's always good to get that. Yeah. Well, they're interesting project. All right. Got to hear about the uh, the family clothing project. Mm-hmm. So that this, that, that yeah. seems to have been a real battle all the way through to get what you yeah. wanted. Yeah, it, it was. Again, this was a case of it being very slow. I mean, partly it happened. It was slow because the original kind of project started up in 2020 and it was, you know, I couldn't meet up with the, the friend who donated the the textile collection. So I, and and I was, you know, not in a creative space in lockdown it didn't it didn't work well for me kind of working doing kind of experimental creative textiles things when everything seemed so difficult so it took a long time before I got going with it but um the background is that a friend had a collection of family clothing and textiles that her mother had created and after her mother had died she didn't know what to do with this lot of stuff you know many people have the same situation of inheriting things from from relatives and they don't really know what to do with it but they knew it's too nice to send to a charity shop or too interesting. So my friend asked me to create an artwork from the textiles and then, um, and then she'd have the textiles back. And in the time it took me to not get around to starting or to be still thinking about it, she eventually decided she didn't want the textiles back and that I could keep them. Um, which means I've now got a huge box of (laughs) somebody else's family history. (laughs) Quite no what I'm going to do with that um she's kind of offloaded the problem onto me um, yeah but, that's that's how I'm seeing it yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment they're still part of they're kind of connected to the artwork that I've produced so they're a kind of belong together at the moment and I'll try and work out what to do with them in the long term um 
but what I just my, because they came in this kind of beautifully packaged in an archive archival box and kind of museum quality storage because my friend had she used to work in that in that world same as me so she, it would kind of come um almost like having a bit of a museum delivered to my doorstep and so I started the original concept I started working on the idea of making some small artworks that didn't use the textiles so I didn't didn't cut anything up didn't stitch into any of the cloth and um, so it would stay as a kind of almost like a museum collection preserved untouched undamaged and then I would make artworks that were inspired by it rather than from it um, and that shifted a little bit when she decided she didn't want them back so I did use some of the textiles to make some of the pieces so I've made a whole series of small pieces um that all fit in a box, an archive box. So they're kind of, it's, the my idea was it's like the experience of when you go to um, an archive or a museum to do research with works on paper, so prints and drawings and, and photographs, they tend to be in these um, archival boxes in a stack with maybe with acid-free tissue between them. So I wanted to make a pin artwork that was like that. So that same kind of experiences, you have to lift one out and see the next and see the next. So all of the pieces I made are kind of, rectangular and flat mostly um and I experimented with techniques that don't use the textiles or don't damage the textiles um so I've used drawing I've used cyanotype I've used I've, I've done rubbings using graphite I've done kind of cut work designs taking designs from some of the edging and I've done a lot of photography um photographing the pieces manipulating the photographs and having them printed on archival paper um a few couple of pieces that are photographs did, printed onto fabric which are then stitched into and then towards the end i also added in a couple of pieces where i've actually used some of the textile some of the garments but stitched in a very kind of cons conservation inspired so a very light touch stitch that could all be removable so I've just folded the cloth rather than cutting it and I've used very kind of clear stitching that could be taken out. So I've kind of followed a almost conservation methodology of only doing things that are removable and that don't cause any permanent change to the to the objects. So we're kind of like a lot of museum theory almost going into how I've approached that artwork. So now I've got this box of about 20, 25, not even sure how many pieces. I have these miniature artworks that tell elements of the story of the family collection, but aren't trying to. It's not obvious what the stories are, you know, you need to kind of need a person alongside with it, talking it through, explaining what, what's in there. Um, but, you know, focusing on little details. Um, like one of the, ch the ch child's shoe as a is a, the, the, which are always powerful kind of objects and metaphors, but one of the children in the family died young so these baby shoes whereas you know she didn't you know so that was the one I wanted to use I wanted to use that child's shoe as the the symbolic so you wouldn't know that in the artwork without my explanation alongside it I also photographed holes and I looked at edges of that kind of like you know there's all sorts of complex meanings in there that I can't keep track of all of them myself because yeah. it's similar to when I was working with the the pin cushions that I started talking about at the beginning they kind of it grew organically i started on one piece and that gave me some ideas for the next piece rather than planning i'm going to make 25 pieces and seven of them will be in this technique and seven of them will be in this technique i just started making and seeing what came up so i took maybe 100 photographs and i've used five yeah. you know because they're the five most interesting ones um so you know there's there's always a lot more out kind of around the the artwork than than is visible in the finished artwork there's always a lot more a lot of extra thinking and processes and ideas and experiments things that didn't work things that just live in the sketchbook because they were disaster terrible cyanotypes that didn't work <laughs> um accident accidental things but um, it was a really interesting process of working through um kind of non-intervention non-damaging processes but there was still very textile you know still about the fibers and the fabrics and the materials and the the hand making um without 
without actually using the fabric. So it was, yeah, really enjoyable project. Um, really, it's been really interesting to share that one as well. Yeah, but but for the for your friend, it's out of stuff that normally would have gone to a resale shop or just gone mm -hmm. to the trash. You've yeah. created a, a a bit of family history. I'm I'm sure that that mm. will for years be be valued at family gatherings. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the situation with this one is that she's pretty much the last of the family oh. left. <laughs> I think that's the thing. That's why she was kind of left with this collection that she didn't really know. She hadn't got anybody to pass it on to. That what do you do with it when you've you're kind of the end of the family line and I am for one side of my family I'm kind of the end of the line <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think everything you know I, I, what, I don't know what, what will happen to it once I'm gone but these are the kind of things I think about quite a lot <laughs> because of my museum background and you know my kind of I have a bit of a inclination to collect things textiles um so you know I've got enough of my own stuff without acquiring other people's things <laughs> And, and but, I think that's yeah. the problem, you know, because I have things that belong to both my maternal grandmother and I think my husband's great grandmother, like her mm -hmm. bloomers. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, you have you you love textiles. Here you go. And I'm like, OK, now what? <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, they, they have a story. They have a, they both have a story. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I, I know the stories of these two ladies, uh, which are completely different their mm. backgrounds um and i'd love to tell their story with their textiles mm. but but, but i hold i look at doesn't it it's a bit kind of an emotional burden that you've got to, i'm now responsible for these right this archive what do i do with it it's like what makes me always makes me smile with particularly things you know like the bloomers and i've got petticoats and this I, that, how would people feel if we knew that like in a hundred years somebody would be like packaging up your underwear <laughs> <laughs> giving it to your great great grandchildren. It's quite a weird idea, isn't it? Oh, how I feel about it. <laughs> Not sure how they would feel about it, knowing that their, you know, their 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 secret, their hidden intimate garments were being right. passed around to their descendants. But it's very common. I don't I don't quite know why. It's an odd thing to end up keeping, but that is, does seem to be what was kept. Right. Right. Yeah, and, I, and you wonder why, you know, she 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 had must have had beautiful clothes. The the bloomers, yeah. I know, that, like the piece of um, that's my my own maternal grandmother's. It's um, it was she was making a tablecloth, um, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was going to be an altar cloth actually for church. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so it never got finished, and it's and it's out of a very rough piece of fabric. So mm -hmm. it's it, to me it's interesting that, mm. and, and then this other's a, a, got, got lace on it, and you know crocheted lace and very fancy and this yeah. is you know the, the the difference in these two ladies lives it's uh mm. that's, yeah, that's position yeah. yeah okay so yeah, now I'm... now we have the ongoing question of best casket and then what is beth doing with the bloomers okay this is <laughs> yeah yeah great <laughs> always something at my house huh <laughs> all right we're gonna run out of time here and and ruth you do have you do have a business <laughs> and uh, so we want to talk about how people can get involved with that because your your maker uh, members, and yeah. then I'm fascinated by your 2023 uh, theme of damage. So mm -hmm. uh, so how how does your business work? How do people get involved with you and participate in all of these things? That's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of lot of things going on there. So yeah, my maker membership is an online group that I set up. Um, during the pandemic as a way of connecting creative people who are interested in the ideas and the way I work rather than textile processes and techniques. So it's more about, um, I talk about doing research and how to, how to approach research, how to turn that research into something, how to build more of this meaning and stories and narratives into whatever it is you're making. So I have textile people, painters um, and writers and all sorts of people, creative practices are in the membership group and one of the opportunities that I create for the membership is um, an online exhibition once a year and next year's exhibition in the early part of the year will be about damage so the idea of that is part of the care project the cultures of care project and it was going to tie in with an exhibition that I have myself in a museum which was going to be about damage and I say going to be because it's all had to change <laughs> since I planned it all because creative problem solving is part of my 
um, my multiple jobs that I do. So that exhibition is now something else, but the damage theme is my, the membership are all busy working on that. So they're creating some new work around that theme. So that's just one of the ways that I like to support the, the membership by um, with learning and experimenting and trying new things. So the membership is a monthly programme. You can join for a month at a time um, and that's open all the time. Um, and then I also have my podcast, Making Meaning, which is just started the new series um, after quite a long break. But we are back now. I've got lots happening. I've recorded uh, several episodes. <laughs> Can't remember in the last few days. I've done loads. <laughs> so that's where I have conversations with other artists and creatives, sometimes with coaches and writers about the meaning behind their work or the stories behind what they do, the kind of the, the hidden histories kind of thing that I'm really interested in. So those are once a fortnight. Um, and then I have a lot of ongoing bits and pieces. I have the uh, the Making Meaning Journal, which you've been talking about kindly, which is a small digital publication sharing some more of the background of my work um, and some of those those stories. So there'll be another issue of that in the new year um, alongside my exhibition which is is in the UK so if you have any listeners in the UK you'll be able to come to that um, and I can't remember what else I probably do loads more other things but I can't remember them yeah. right now <laughs> That's well, talk, talk about this damage theme what okay and you, you've got a uh, what Karen Logan and Mandeep I'm not even gonna ah, try that last name yeah how, how does that whole work <laughs> So that's a different, that, that's oh. a whole, that's, no, that was, this is where it's had to change, I've had to change the project in order, because of some issues with the museum I was working with. So it was going to be a whole project about damage Oh. in the exhibition. So now that's just the membership working on that. And my exhibition, which will be, there will be an online version as well. So everybody will be able to see it, is now about homes and belongings and, sorry, home and belonging, not, not the object, belonging in a place um and both Mandeep and Karen who are two artists I'm collaborating with to produce some new work around that theme both of them are working with me over the winter to create new work for that exhibition and I will be including in the exhibition some work about the, the museum that it's going to be in the exhibition is in a museum which is an old house so it's a mm. 18th century house turned into a museum quite recently so I'm going to be doing some work about that that something to do with a, a, a home turning into a museum and how that kind of changes how we feel about buildings whether people live in them or not and and I've got a whole series of work that has been ongoing about um deserted medieval villages which is another kind of like English countryside thing <laughs> um which are they're archaeological sites that were were villages um small villages and that were abandoned or people were forced to leave way back in like the 1400s 1500s um but there, there's still like of lumps and bumps left in in the fields and you can kind of see that like you were talking about these Holloway the the cut the 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 paths, the footpaths that have been cut deep into the into the ground from generations of people walking on them. So there's quite a lot of those around in the area that I live, and there's lots of them in England. Um, and they're really interesting archaeologically, but I find them interesting to look at the emotional history of people being evicted from their homes and how we um, how we look at them now as just as a kind of historic monument, whereas actually they're like the ruins of people's homes, which is you know, so I'm interested in the emotional side, the emotional histories of that. So I've got a whole new series of work about that kind of area, um, that kind of work, which will be part of this exhibition about homes and belonging and um, community, which covers a whole broad selection of things. And yeah, there will be online versions of that. There will be a Making Meaning Journal that will cover that in more detail and uh, lots more to come, basically. <laughs> Just a lo loads of things, loads and loads of things, um, but all really exciting things. So it's really nice to have a chance to to talk about them and to share them. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and especially you know with the refugee crisis, we've got mm -hmm. a whole other um, idea yeah. with you know yeah, moving that, and that, home, that and is, that's that another is in there as well. Yeah, that, that is in there because 
this is another subject we can't get into. My my grandma was a refugee a hundred years ago, so I'm working on things to do with her story. But I don't think they're going to come out in this round of the exhibition just because I've got quite a lot of other things to do. But that's been right. a project that's you know turning that family history into creative work is an ongoing project that I'll probably be working on for years. But it's yeah, there are definitely um, elements of that will come into this. To this exhibition and that kind of th those threads will carry on into future projects as well because every everything I do kind of connects in some way you know they all kind of they all do flow together um eventually I sometimes have to kind of draw out those threads and work out how they connect because <laughs> there's these lots of different ideas but um they do all they do all connect because they all come from me and so it's you know right. that they all part of who I am and that comes out in what I choose to make Yep. Well, Ruth, uh, quite a world you've created for yourself. It's uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, thanks for uh, making time to share it with us. You're very welcome. It's been really interesting. Thank you very much. All right. And thanks oh, thank to everyone you. for listening.